um, guest speaker um, for our final session before the panel discussion. There she is, the lovely Liz. Um, this is Liz Wilson who is a clinical nurse specialist at King's College Hospital. Um, she's put together a really valuable talk on the benefits of patient resources um, and hopefully we'll be able to signpost us all to some of those. So Liz, over to you. Thanks very much, Bethan, for the introduction. I hope everybody can see uh, my presentation. Please do let me know if not. We can see it. Thank you. Um, so yes, hello, my name is Liz. I'm a clinical nurse specialist within the Inherited Cardiac Condition Service. Uh, I work under King's Health Partners, predominantly at King's College Hospital, but also uh, with Guy's and St. Thomas's uh, Hospital Trust as well. And I'm going to be talking uh, with you today about uh, ICC patient resources. And uh, in regards to uh, what I'll be covering, hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you'll have a broader understanding uh, of why resources are so vital and so important uh, for ICC patient groups uh, in regards to support and education. We'll touch upon uh, types of resources in general, but also the importance of tailoring uh, to individual patient needs. I'll recommend some resources that uh, we use and greatly rely upon within uh, ICC and I'll touch upon uh, some future Watch This Space uh, projects that I'm very excited about. So why is support and education uh, so important? And I, and I think uh, I'm very pleased that I followed up uh, post uh, that um, story from Joe that was very powerful and I think in itself uh, gives uh, uh, numerous reasons why support and education is, is so important. Our patients are generally for life, uh, whether it's in the context of being uh, affected or, or a suspicion of being affected by an ICC, but also for the wider family in regards to regular screening uh, that Nabil was discussing earlier. We do get patients in younger age groups uh, in comparison to other cardiac specialities um, and, and that's very important to, to know but also it's not just young people uh, that present with our services. We look after a broad spectrum of different uh, age ranges. We put our patients in a, a rather unique position in that uh, there is a level of expectation uh, for them to provide or to be educators within their family, in particular their first degree relatives. Uh, and just to recap that, parents, siblings and children if applicable. And it's, it's important for our patients to have a good understanding of, of their condition. It's important that they understand the uh, potential inheritance of their condition from parent to child. They know what good quality screening is and of course um, where to find it as well and it's paramount that, that we support uh, to make sure that, that they're equipped with that information when they do speak to their families. And of course um, as with a, a many patient groups but certainly with an ICC our patients do have very complex needs that we, we need to be very engaged and aware of. And these aren't just physical needs as I know has been discussed earlier there is a, uh, a large amount of our patient groups that have uh, little to no symptoms at all for a lot of their patient journey with us. And they have other priorities and those priorities are, are very important uh, as well as the, the physical needs. And examples of this may be um, in regards to uh, a, a young uh, child who has been in and out of hospital and wants to join new sports groups. Uh, to make new friends and, and feeling comfortable and their parents feeling comfortable with that. To supporting a young adult that's moving away from home, possibly going to university and being more independent in the management of their condition. To wanting to start a family and understanding reproductive options, being able to financially support their family and have those uh, vocational experiences despite um, having an ICC. And throughout all of that, supporting good quality uh, care so that they reach older age uh, with as, as fewer symptoms uh, and with as, as great a quality and quantity of life as possible. I'm just going to touch very briefly on the Lee's model of adherence. This is actually a model that dates back to the late 1980s, but it's been revalidated so many times since then. And in regards to uh, 
uh, patient uh, education and understanding and being able to recall that information is absolutely vital in our patient groups for the exact reason that we need to engage a family as well as an individual and they're two very very equally important aspects of what we do and it is shocking profoundly uh, so that, that potentially up to 80 percent um, specifically between 40 and 80 percent of medical information from studies uh, since this model um, is immediately forgotten uh, by patients so the key message is validation we need to help validate uh, what we're telling our patients and be able to support them in learning and understanding in a way that suits them. So how do we do this? And of course, uh, you would have guessed uh, resources um, and we have a plethora. We live in an age of both privilege and uh, potential misguidance in terms of what's available out there. So it is really, really important that we uh, we help our patients in terms of finding information and avoiding misinformation um, that, that can be out there. I don't think that printed uh, leaflets and, and written information uh, should be underestimated short term. I know we're moving away from that, but they're such a powerful tool with those initial face to face um, interactions that we have with patients in order to give that visual uh, validation um, for, for what we're talking about, which is generally in the context of something quite traumatic, hugely traumatic, either to that person as an individual or in regards to a, a loved one. Um, but they are short term. And so it's important that we uh, we also think about um, downloadable or a more electronic uh, and more accessible forms of resource. Um, so we're able to back up um, that information given in an initial appointment so patients are able to access it electronically um, elsewhere if, if they want to, to validate what, what they've been told and what they've learned in their appointments. Patient stories um, such as, as, as with Joe, the, these are conditions that are rare um, and it is really important for patients to know they're not alone. And we know that video resources have a great um, impact in terms of increased understanding and also um, helping to lessen anxiety about learning about having a heart condition. So having videos um, uh, are an important aspect uh, as well as having that written uh, information. Support networks and forums. Now, it's a massive topic and patients often get very anxious when I um, speak about this because they feel that there's a almost a spotlight, a level of engagement that they need to commit to with this. There are one to one. Um, uh, there is one to one su support, of course, and, and there are forums and wider communities. And it's all about having that collective intelligence. Um, not just about the science, not just about the medicine, but also about understanding how people are feeling, uh, how people are coping, how families are coping. And you can have as little or much engagement with that as possible. And it's important to um, explore what's available. And, and if, if one type of, of support network doesn't work, to see whether there are others that are better suited out there for that individual. And it does all come back to making sure that we are tailoring and listening to our patients and, and making ourselves available to those patients to understand their needs and how we can help them and to validate what we're talking about uh, in our consultations with them through uh, resources. Um, so where do we go for that? So in regards to uh, where we um, signpost our patients, uh, some of these you're probably very aware of, and certainly the British Heart Foundation uh, is very widely known and respected as a cardiovascular research charity. Um, they do have a broad scope, um, inclusive of many, many conditions, but they're inherited cardiac condition resources, inclusive of uh, printed, which can be uh, sent in the post, downloadable uh, video resources, support networks, heartline, which is manned by nurses, 
there, it, it has a plethora of resources for ICC specific um, out there and you only have to, to, to go onto the website and search those conditions to get that information. Cardiomyopathy UK, which I um, heard Joe touch upon there, fantastic um, charity who are very specifically designed um, to support patients with cardiomyopathies. So they are uh, looking at very specific, um, as well as, as general information, uh, specific guidance in terms of driving insurance, whether that be life or health insurance, supporting patients and families uh, through difficult times. And they also have, I believe, a CMUK nurse line as well, which is a great resource for patients. I would really advocate the welcome pack which is a, a pack that gets sent through the post and you can decide, um, it's a click box, um, what resources you'd like included in that pack. And there's also a quarterly magazine in there as well, which talks a lot about all the positive um, uh, projects and research that's going into cardiomyopathy. Arrhythmia Alliance, again, a bit more of a broader scope. This is a, a sort of coalition of of research experts, of course, patients and carers, and talks um, and, and generally is an overview in, in terms of arrhythmia. But what is very useful uh, about Arrhythmia Alliance is that they have a, a patient educational virtual uh, platform, which is video based. It comes at a cost, and we have to be honest with patients about that because uh, it is £10 um, that it does give you access to hundreds of videos and that could be anything from devices and patients feed, feed back to me that having video um, education about devices is, is hugely beneficial um, as well as tests, medications, types of rhythms they've come in, um, you know, what does this ECG mean? Uh, and I would highly advocate um, they, there's a free um, sort of bite-sized videos that you can watch just to see um, that that's a really good resource. Uh, cardiac risk for the young uh, and sudden arrhythmic death UK, so that's CRY and SADS UK. Uh, just uh, going back to Dan's presentation, um, they are hugely uh, paramount in terms of supporting uh, bereaved families uh, in terms of, of sudden sudden death and cardiac arrest survivors as well because there are survivors out there but also they focus very much and do wonderful work in the community in regards to screening and have lots of resources about screening and upping the profile uh, in the general community working with GPs working with coroners talking about molecular autopsies, working with families uh, in regards to getting that genetic testing out there. Um, there is some very, very good information, particularly on SADS UK, about particular conditions as well. For our patients with the iron channel problems, the channelopathies, we do have some really useful resources because with these patients, it's more about avoidance and lifestyle as opposed to um, medication, although that's not always the case. It's obviously individual. Um, but Credible Meds, which is an app and, and you can also get online, it just basically allows not just patients, but, but practitioners uh, that may not be used to uh, long QT syndrome specifically and guiding when new medications are, are started in the community or by a non cardiac specialist and whether that can potentially increase the risk of, of QT prolongation. Equally with uh, Brigada drugs, uh, they are, it, it's a website which can provide uh, the similar information in terms of drug avoidance and also some, some downloadable information in, in multiple language formats. Um, it, for example, if, if it was someone going on holiday or, or someone whose English wasn't their first language uh, in regards to uh, what to avoid. And they're very, very useful for those specific patient groups. And it's really important, and I know this is going to be spoken about um, later in the day in more detail, to, to appreciate the mental well-being aspect and the psychological aspect um, in supporting our patients, along with obviously those professionals, the psychologists and, and psychiatry. And mind.org.uk is a, a fantastic resource in terms of uh, patients being able to look at um, their mental well-being, looking at relaxation uh, and how they can help support 
uh, and putting coping mechanisms for, for what is sometimes uh, obviously very uh, traumatic. Uh, I would mention here as well in parts um, and there are resources on there for mind body link um, uh, situations and these for, for patients that often experience a lot of anxiety and potentially the symptoms of anxiety are very similar to those symptoms that we look at with heart problems and being able to work through those in a safe environment uh, and differentiate and put those coping mechanisms in place. For bereavement, uh, cruise.org.uk um, is, is a fantastic resource. Uh, really concentrating on support uh, of those that are, are bereaved and actually have some, some sort of personalised questionnaires and tailored services to support families as well uh, in, in regards to their, their personal situations. And it shouldn't be forgotten um, that a lot of people are still learning uh, about genetics and a lot of people are unaware of genetics. And when we talk to patients about genetic testing, it's very important I would say even before they're talking to counsellors and nurse specialists uh, when they're preparing for testing to make sure that they do have access to resources such as the Genetic Alliance in order to get more information and of course support networks as well. So obviously that's a tall order and we need to make sure that we're constantly reviewing and we're constantly evolving our services around our patients to make sure that we are providing that support and able to uh, signpost them to those resources. We have some really fantastic projects, um, certainly across uh, Guys and St Thomas's and King's College, one of which are the MedTap video resources. Uh, and MedTap is uh, an app, it's free and downloadable. And um, it is uh, something that a senior uh, cardiovascular pharmacist, Gail Campbell, put together. The resources currently are heart failure and um, atrial fibrillation, but ICC are going to soon be filming and adding our resources on there as well. And that will be video resources about conditions for patients listening to patients in, in forums and, and giving feedback opportunities. At King's College, we're about to start a project in psychology and making sure that we are assessing anxiety and depression in our patient groups better and listening to patients' thoughts on that. And our nurse-led follow-up clinics, uh, which is a new initiative that's been designed solely for the purpose of support and education and to be guided by our patients about their needs as opposed to the sort of traditional appointments that talk about symptoms and uh, the clinical uh, aspects of, of their care. And it's all very, very exciting and, and watch the space uh, initiatives there. Thank you so much. Um, I have got the website link because I know there was a lot of resources on there um, for you to use in future. And of course, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Um, a very lovely, very clear talk, signposting to um, a lot of resources there. And you're right, people learn in a variety of ways. Some are more visual, some are more auditory. And um, having that range of resources really means that people will be able to, to take on the information in a way that best suits them. Where do you think we need to build um, build upon in the array of resources that we have available? For example, I mean, one of the things that really came out in the pandemic was that there is a great disparity in access to IT and computers and being able to sit down and look at a website. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's a very valid point. We, we do need to be very aware of what resources are available to patients. And, and what I, I forgot to mention in, in my presentation was that with the pandemic, there's been a greater focus on, uh, for example, virtual clinics um, and be making sure that patients have access to that. And it is something that needs to be addressed. And not all patients will want to have their information uh, online. And we need to make sure that, again, we are tailoring that. For those um, uh, in terms of, of our projects, it's been really, really key for us to understand that and, and where patients are struggling and where those barriers are in terms of, of being able to access resources and accessing the resources that are right for them. Um, so it, it's something that, that we need to evolve on and I can certainly uh, have hope that uh, we're, we're getting there. And as long as we keep listening to patients 
and reviewing our services, uh, hopefully evolving to be uh, supportive. Yeah, well, that's the theme of the day, isn't it? To listen to our patients and to develop our services for, for what for what patients need. Um, great. Thank you so very much, Liz. I hope you will join us with the other speakers as well for the panel discussion.